All right, well, welcome, everybody. My name is Lenny Zeltzer, and I want to talk to you about incident response. I'm going to try not using the microphone, because then I feel like singing to you, and I'm not that good at singing. But if you can't hear me in the back of the room, just kind of let me know, and, and I'll use the mic. I, I think I can handle it. Yeah, but I'm OK so far? Yeah, good. So I, uh, I, I do incident handling sometimes. And what I found is that a lot of companies prepare for incident handling. And then when a problem occurs, turns out that nobody was doing what they were supposed to. Nobody was reading the procedures. Or maybe the procedures, turns out, don't even exist. So that's the type of scenario that I want to explore in this talk. Also, this is part of the larger uh, project, if you will, that I've undertaken. And that is the realization that I've had that a lot of the security advice that we as practitioners give to, to companies just isn't practical for 98% of the companies, right? And, and this is advice like uh, uh, be proactive about security or um, exercise defense in depth, all wonderful advice. But then you look at organizations, and none of them are proactive, or not none of them, but many of them aren't. They don't do defense in depth. And I've realized that maybe I shouldn't take it personally. Maybe it's OK. Maybe you know, life goes on and businesses survive. So I'm trying to figure out, well, what kind of advice can I give as a security consultant for Savis or as a, um, an instructor at SANS, what kind of a advice can I give for organizations that just won't get the time to be proactive about security? So, so incident response is one area that I'm looking into. And so uh, you, you know, you've, got, you've got best practices that, 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 that are really good that give you very detailed instructions for how to prepare for the incident and how to handle it. You, uh, at SANS, we teach a, a full course on incident handling. Uh, NIST has a very nice guide for, for the various stages you need to go through. Um, what are some of the things that you've got to do to prepare for during an incident? Anybody does incident handling? Yes, sir? Like, uh, you prepare certain tool tools. Right, you got some bootable CDs. You got your USB keys in your, in your, in your bag. Um, you you train your staff for how to detect problems, how to triage. So it's all great and it's it's all wonderful and I and I recommend people consider it. And yet, what if you are in an organization that just hasn't gotten around to following that advice, right? Uh, and and of course I'm kidding about you sitting around not doing anything, right? We're all just really busy people, we're all fighting fires, we're all being drawn in different directions. So it's not surprising that many companies just aren't prepared for handling security incidents and they catch them by surprise. And so that's what I want to explore in this talk and it's not a talk about what tools to use. I'm not going to be talking about any tools because to me incident handling at its core is a coordination problem. Um, there, is, there is a person or a group of people who are being counted up upon to gain control over the situation. And so if you look at how many companies have handled incidents, you know, you read news about them and you wonder, well, why in the world did they do that? They, they make so many mistakes. That's not how I would have handled the problem. Well, it's not that they're bad companies or that they're, they don't know what they're doing. The problem is that they're under stress. And when people are under stress, mistakes are made, and that's to be expected. So I'm trying to figure out how to take a little bit of stress away from the, the initial stage of the incident. And that stage is where an incident handler, such as myself or such as yourself, is called into a situation, and people believe a, a system has been compromised or some data might have been lost. And now it's the job of the incident handler to figure out what's going on and how to then commence full-blown incident handling. Right? So, and it's a stressful position. And I find myself in that position quite a bit because I'm asked to assist my customers with incidents. And what I found that releases a lot of the stress for me and, and makes me feel comfortable walking into the situation and asserting my authority is uh, knowing what questions to ask. So this talk is going to be very much about what types of questions to ask to gain control over the situation that you're walking into. 
And it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. So I've broken this questionnaire, if you will, down into several uh, key steps. The start of this process is you get a phone call at 1 AM because you're the incident handler on duty. And on the other line, somebody says, we've got a problem. We think our web server got hacked. So here you are, all sleepy, dragging yourself out of bed, uh, maybe driving quickly into the office, or probably in most cases get, getting into a conference call. And now a lot of people are looking at you for advice. So that's the start. The end goal is you, having figured out what happened, gained control over the situation, assigned responsibilities, and now you can f commence with a full-blown incident response where people um, identify the exact scope of the problem and eradicate it and contain the issue and then return back to business. So expect to have to walk into the situation blindfolded. Whether you are a consultant walking into a company that you really don't know much about, but you're being asked for help, or whether you perform incident response within your organization, in many cases, you won't know much about the infrastructure that was affected by the problem. A web server got hacked. Well, maybe you don't know much about this web server. You don't know what data resides there. You don't know what systems it talks to. And what I find is most challenging when I deal with situations like this is I don't know who are the people involved who might have been affected by the problem or who managed the system. I just I don't know much about the problem except that something bad happened. So one of the first things that I think we need to think about is how, as an incident handler who just walked into the problem, how to assert your authority. How to, because people get calm when they are next to a person who is calm as well. And so if you think about um, doctors, Right. Here's the situation. You walk into a doctor. Maybe you've got a health issue. Maybe it's just your annual checkup. And the doctor is calm. And the doctor always wears the laboratory white coat. Why? It's not like you're going to start spitting blood on him right there. In the, right? But, but he wears the white coat. And he always carries the stethoscope. He always carries the stethoscope, though he doesn't really use it. But that's the look of the doctor that you've come to expect. So. He gives you what you're looking for, because when you look at a doctor like that, he's calm, and all of a sudden you feel better. And so as an instant handler, I'm not suggesting you wear the white lab coat, although it turns out in studies, people who are, wear white lab coats exert a lot of authority all of a sudden, just automatically. There's something about the white lab coat. Uh, but, but perhaps it's the, uh, the types of questions that you ask, it's the type of posture that you have, or it's the, the type of um, uh, voice that you use that's calm, and other people all of a sudden will start looking up to you. Uh, the, the idea here is uh, listen more and talk less. Because a, a lot of people, and, and I sometimes tr fall into that um, problem, and I, and, I, and I try to restrain myself. A lot of people, when they are, get called into the situation, right away you start commanding, because you feel like that's how you're going to exercise control. You do that, you do that. Listen to the problem first. And since I'm talking about doctors, I, I read a study that looked into um, the likelihood that a doctor might be subjected to a, uh, to a lawsuit, to a malpractice lawsuit. Because uh, some doctors get hit with them a lot, and there are some doctors who've been practicing for years and haven't been hit by a, a, class, by a malpractice lawsuit. And what they found was a significant variable was simply how much time does a doctor take to listen to the answers to the question that he asks you. And those do doctors that spend just an extra minute listening to their patients, turns out their rate of being sued drastically drops. Maybe because the patients feel like they've got a, a friend, a partner in front of them. And so the same advice goes to us. Right? Just, just listen to see what the problem is. Because a lot of people are going to be talking. And right now, you don't know what's what. Um, maybe the initial diagnosis of the problem was incorrect. Maybe it's not the web server that got hacked. Maybe it's the, uh, the firewall in front of it that's uh, participating in some kind of an injection attack. But you listen and you try to figure out what's going on. And so just because incident handling is stressful, I thought I'd throw in little flowers here and there in the presentation because we can all use a little bit more flowers in our lives. But the this, this process of walking in and, and uh, um, gaining control of the situation, what types of questions are we asking? 
what's the nature of the problem, right? These are open-ended questions. And whether you're, uh, I don't know if you've heard a uh, policeman, right? So somebody complains to them that something has happened. They ask you, you know, so what's, what seems to be happening? Uh, what's the nature of the problem? And let people talk it out. And you're just listening and taking notes. In many cases, I do this when I'm on a conference call. And so I'm just typing as fast as I can so that I can uh, quickly absorb the information and retain my notes so that I can later analyze them. What are people seeing? What do they think is the nature of the problem? And you're not correcting them at this point because you don't know enough about the situation to correct the problem. Uh, how is the problem detected and by whom? That's a very important question because right away when you ask this question and you hear an answer, you'll get a good sense for how mature are the security practices of this environment. Because if somebody tells you the problem was um, detected because one of our customers called us up and told us our web server got hacked, all right, well, that tells you something about the types of controls and monitoring that's going on in this environment. Or if you hear that um, our regular monitoring that pulls the system once a minute told us that our website, website was changed, well, now you know that the environment at least has some good visibility into it. What are the security infrastructure components that exist there is another question to ask. And uh, a lot of people I find uh, are afraid to ask these questions because they don't want to sound ignorant. Well, I think it's okay because by asking these questions, you, you show that you're genuinely interested in understanding the problem. So it's okay to ask, do we have firewalls in here? Do we have antivirus? Is there any kind of intrusion detection system in place? Don't assume that there is one. What's the security posture of the environment? You're walking into the situation and, and you're trying to, to understand how mature are the security practices here? Have they recently had a security assessment done? And if so, what types of problems were found? Because right away, this can help you um, create some theories about what uh, might be the reason for the problem, right? They had a security assessment done a year ago. Turns out they had a lot of, uh, I don't know, um, uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities. All right, so maybe that's also what's going on right now. So you're starting to formulate your theories, but right now you're probably keeping them to yourself. Because yet again, you don't know enough to really advise uh, people in the room just yet. And also, it's important to ask, well, who was affected by this? Right? If it's a web server, well, um, find out. Well, who uses the web server? Is it your, your customers? Is it your partners? What about your internal teams? Do they know that the problem has actually happened? I've, I've responded to a lot of incidents where a fair bit of time was spent trying to figure out the problem, and it turns out that the actual business owners of the infrastructure never even were brought into the picture until maybe too late. And also, what else has happened here recently? Right? You want to know, well, does this site have a history of being compromised once a month? Important questions to ask. So uh, at this point in your, in your incident response, as, a, as the incident handler, you, you have a, a general sense of what's happening here, what infrastructure is affected, maybe, in a very general sense, and who are the people that you're talking to? The next thing I suggest, and, and what I find useful, is make sure everybody understands who's doing what and how you're communicating with each other. This is important because in many cases, your, your teams are, are going to be remote. Right? So I do a lot of my um, initial incident coordination by phone. It helps to have a good phone. It helps to have a, a conference bridge number you can use to bring the team together. And so uh, recognize that you'll be working with a lot of people that, wh whom you don't know. And it's OK to ask them, hey, what do you do? I know I've seen your name before, but I don't quite know what your area of responsibility is. And you want to know that because you want to know when to talk to them and when to ask them questions, when to seek their uh, advice. Uh, understand uh, what responsibilities people currently involved with the project have. Right? Is this the DBA? Is this the web administrator? Is this the business owner? Is this the project manager? Is this the sales executive? for the customer who was affected. Uh, and then, if you have the authority, you can start assigning roles. Right? Sometimes, depending on how your incident response program has been designed, sometimes you have the ability to say, all right, so now you are responsible for uh, calling the legal counsel. You are responsible for communicating with the affected business users. Sometimes you don't have that responsibility. But um, try, to, try to assert that authority. In many cases, what I found is that companies that haven't been prepared for an incident don't quite know who has the authority when an incident has happened. 
they, they actually don't know. And everybody's kind of looking to see, well, who will take that role? If you're an incident handler, then you're kind of expected to coordinate everybody's response, then you should probably take that responsibility. And uh, see if anybody doesn't like that, see if anybody complains. In many cases, people will be glad that you are taking uh, the lead and assuming the authority to assign responsibilities to the group. Uh, and another important thing to consider at this stage when you're thinking about who you're going to communicate and, and, and how, it, understand how you're going to interact with other groups. What groups are involved in an incident? Anybody responded to an incident? Who did you need to talk to? Hmm. Yeah. Developers. Developers. If the web application was affected, right? Who wrote it? Uh, anybody else? What other groups besides the, the core IT folk? Yes. Legal. legal team, right? I mean, nowadays it's nowadays companies care about security because there is some legal ramifications for um, for not doing it right. So the legal team. Anybody else? Public affairs, um, PR departments, if your customers are affected, you want to make sure that somebody is uh, appraising them of the situation in a way that's uh, consistent with your policies. Uh, yes? Third party vendor. Maybe, maybe the code was written by somebody else. Or maybe uh, you have a, a third party managing the system or some components of it. Yes? Uh, I'm sorry, system owners? Yeah, right. Who, who is actually the business user who's, um, whose systems were affected? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's critical because the system owner probably can help you understand, well, how big of a deal is this? Because in many cases, the techie people don't know. Right? They, they know really well how to manage the operating system, maybe the network. How big of a deal is this? Yeah. So, ah, good point. So sometimes the system owner is one group, but the data owner is another group. Right, so, so yeah, I mean, and the thing is, it's okay not to know this, I feel. If you're an incident handler that's from outside of the group, right, in many cases, incident handling is handled by a separate team or even by a separate company, it's okay to ask these questions. And, and I don't think you show your ignorance by asking these questions. I think you actually show like you genuinely want to understand the nature of the problem. And, and so whenever you understand these teams, right, and it turns out, and you can ask these questions, and, and answers like this will come up in the, in the team meeting or in, or in the conference call, uh, write down the names of the groups, and then make sure somebody is responsible for communicating with that group. Right? If, if you've identified that these are the groups that may need to be involved, we'll make sure somebody keeps them in the loop. Because a, a, a key source of stress, I find, in incident response is people just don't know what's happening. And if they don't know, they'll get stressed. They'll start calling you directly. They'll start calling your boss. And an easy way to keep the situation under the control under control is to have somebody periodically appraise them of the situation. Yeah. The the types of questions that come to mind as 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 part of this um, process is uh, who is the primary incident handler here? Don't assume that everybody knows it's you, and maybe it's not you. Maybe you're mistaken. So just up front, ask, hey, so who's in charge here? I can be in charge if you want me to, or maybe I am in charge. But make sure there are not too many cooks in the kitchen. I found in some incidents, uh, people are, are communicating, and, and there are several people who think they're in charge. Well, there's a problem with too many cooks in the kitchen. And uh, I think, I firmly believe that there should be a single person who is ultimately in charge here. Because otherwise, if there are two people or three people, then they can make assumptions about, well, I thought that the other person's handling that. I thought that you're handling that. And turns out nobody does a particular task. Who's authorized to make business decisions? Is it the data owner? Is it the system owner? Because the business decisions will need to be made. Like, do we shut down the affected systems? Do we keep going? How long do we have until, um, until really this becomes a big deal, right? Who is authorized to make those decisions? In many cases, people don't know. IT people often don't know that. How will we stay in touch? Do we do it via email? Or do we think that email might have, may have been compromised and we need to communicate out of band? Which phone numbers should we use? Which conference numbers are, are, do we have available? Do we know each other's mobile phone numbers, home phone numbers, faxes? This is also important. How often will we reconvene to appraise each other of the situation? And, often how, uh, and also, how often will we update the other groups? And, and I find that it's important to have this scheduled. Because once again, having some kind of a schedule uh, gives you a feeling of control. And a feeling of, of control often translates to the actual control. 
So, uh, for example, you know, maybe on hourly on, or every other hour, somebody on your team will be responsible for calling up the business or the data owner and telling them what's going on now. Maybe if you have no updates, even, ha even doing that regularly, even if you have nothing new to report, will give people a sense that you're moving forward. Because otherwise, if people don't hear from you, they'll kind of assume you're not doing anything. But that's what I find. People assume the worst under these stressful situations. Yes, sir? Mm. So, so the question is, uh, how do we uh, maintain um, um, notes and, and progress reports and uh, uh, catalog our findings in a way that's uh, uh, friendly towards the legal process, forensically sound uh, evidence, uh, um, chain of custody, that type of stuff? Um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question because I, I, uh, it's, it's the question to ask your legal team because they might interpret their obligations differently. For example, um, the chain of custody requirements are very uh, rigorous for, for law enforcement, but what people are realizing now is that maybe if you're in the private sector, uh, you, you're cut a lot more slack, and maybe it's okay not to have everything under lock and key sometimes. Uh, so, but I don't want to make those recommendations because that's, it really depends on how the legal team within your company interprets what your responsibilities are. But you definitely want to keep in mind just from a common sense that whatever notes you take, people don't, can't just easily tamper with them, of course. And most importantly, I find, is you want to make sure that whatever communications you, you use, whatever method of communications you use, you don't let the attackers know what you're up to. Right? If your email server is compromised, or you think it might be compromised, don't use it to update each other of your staff. And, uh, and yes, yeah, sometimes the safest thing is to use pa pen and paper if you're not sure which infrastructure components have been compromised. And, uh, and it is often ha also helpful if you have the staff to have uh, a couple of people assigned to the task so they can kind of watch over each other. And then if somebody asks, they can validate that really nothing um, improper occurred when you were investigating the problem. Um, the incident handling that I'm talking about is really incident coordination, which means that the coordinator isn't necessarily a technical person and is probably not the one who's going to be doing in the field uh, forensic work or, or lab analysis work. You want to designate those people. In many cases, that's a different expertise. In many cases, the systems that are affected in a different ge are, is in a different geography. Make sure you understand whom do you have nearby. And if they're not nearby, maybe you need to start flying them out there. So at this point, you got a general sense of the situation. You know who is doing what and how you're communicating with each other. And then the next step in my mind is to really start to better understand the scope of the problem. And this is where you're starting to look at the information that was gathered. And now you're starting to ask questions that really um, test the theories that other people's, people have formed before you got involved. And the important um, uh, aspect of the problem that I'm always after is try to identify, well, how are the infrastructure components that might be affected related to each other? And to understand that, I often try to understand, well, how does data flow through the system? In many cases, I don't know that before I come in. In many cases, IT personnel doesn't know how the data flows, so they need to ask. And what I'm trying to establish is that, yes, initially it looks like, let's say, this web server got compromised, but maybe the web server has an application with logon credentials to the database. And the database resides on a different subnet behind the firewall. Well, that doesn't matter. If the server is compromised, that attacker may have gotten your logon credentials to access the database. And now, all of a sudden, the scope of the problem has expanded. That's what you're trying to understand. But rather than asking, so what do you think are the other systems that are affected by it, try to ask questions about data and flow and application components. Uh, and, and interesting things will come to light when you try to go beyond just the core OS and network infrastructure, but start asking about data and dependencies. Because right? it's, it's like a domino effect. One system tips, and it affects other systems as well. And also very critical when you're trying to understand how data flows and which infrastructure components may have been affected is trying to understand, well, we are going to have to triage and make careful use of the limited human resources we have available. So what should be the next system or the next application that we really pay attention to? And in many cases, it's going to be one that's most critical or one that's, one that's most brittle, one that you know if somebody just gently touches it, it's just going to crumble. Maybe it's one that you've always been worried about. 
and you're gonna look into it next, right? So, so start thinking about what your next steps are. What's the most critical application? What's the most risky application? What should be you, you looking at next? And you can't necessarily make that decision that's the one to bring up to the whole incident response group because you don't know much about the environment. And then, of course, nowadays you gotta think about any kind of compliance, any kind of regulations, any kind of contractual obligations that you might have that might make it very explicit who needs to be notified and when. Right? And the compliance, we all know the, the, the regulations that we're talking about, if it's financial data, it's gremlich bliley if it's cardholder data, it's PCI um, requirements. Um, if you have a compliance officer in your company, you probably want to get him or her involved to answer this question. And that often is, is if you, when you talk to the business owners or to the data owners, that's often going to be the first thing on their mind. So regardless of what we may want to do, what do we have to do? Because the law says so. And in many cases, people don't know right away. But start to understand what, what's the nature of the problem and what compliance implications are carried with it. So in terms of the specific questions that I ask at this point, it's, yeah, it's what's directly affected? Um, what applications are there? Uh, you'll be surprised how many system administrators or, or technical security personnel focus their efforts on the OS and on the network and somehow don't think to ask, well, what's the application here? What's the data that's affected? Ultimately, it's not about the networks and the systems. It's nowadays about the data. Compliance regulations. Um, you're also at this point starting to think, well, not only what data may have been affected and what systems, but also how could they have gotten in? Because down the line, you'll probably want to make sure that they're blocked. So what I often ask is, well, what are the different ways of getting into this environment legitimately? Right, forget about um, uh, somebody hacking your firewall at this point. Uh, you know, think about legitimate ways of getting in, because that's probably the easiest way to get in, right upon that opening that already exists. And you'll find out that there's this VPN tunnel, there's this open firewall port with Telnet or SSH open, there's this partner that has a way in, there are these uh, internal users that have another connection into this environment. Hmm, all right, so now you, you, you can start thinking about what pa inwards paths to examine. And secondly, find out, well, how can data get out? Because the fact that they got in, I mean, it's a problem for integrity, but really what nowadays people are concerned about, well, did any data get out? And if so, how could it have gotten out? And I often ask, you know, how is the firewall configured here? Does it block outbound traffic by default and only allow very specific protocols through? In many cases, no, everything's allowed outbound. But you want to ask those questions as well. And yeah, at this point, you can ask about theories, right? Because people who are participating in this incident, they probably have already been doing this for a little bit longer than you because you get, get involved a little bit later after them. Have they formed any theories? Um, and yeah, write them down and start thinking about why they think these theories are valid and maybe try to invalidate these theories. And another thing to consider in terms of your liability and also being a good citizen is uh, uh, what risk are we posing to other organizations? Do we have, are we, a provider to another partner. And now if our environment's affected, they could be affected as well. Or is our system being used as part of a bot network and we're now all of a sudden attacking somebody else that carries legal implications as well. So that's another question to ask. So, all right, so now you know uh, your, you have a pretty good sense of the scope of the problem, right? There's still a lot more work to do, but you're just trying to understand who's affected, what's affected, how big of a deal is it? to better understand the scope and to start being able to validate the theories that people formed about what exactly has happened here, um, you want to review the, the results of the initial survey that was performed. And what do I mean by the initial survey? Well, before an instant handler gets invoked, usually there's some system administrator or help desk that performs some initial qualification steps to determine that this is a security problem. Maybe it's not a security problem, maybe just process crashed. So you want to understand whoever performed some initial examination of the systems affected, what did they find? So I've, uh, um, this is to perform the initial assessment, the initial uh, survey of the system, I'm not gonna talk about it, right? These are the tools that people use, you look at the processes, you look at the file system, you look at recently modified files, you look at your logs. So uh, if you're interested in that, I, I'm gonna pass around a cheat sheet that I've that I've prepared, uh, I'm not gonna discuss it, but these are really the steps that I find system administrators often wanna take to just qualify the nature of the problem. You know, and just 
feel free to look at it, feel free to pass it around your organization. And um, I'll give you a link where you can download a copy of this if I didn't print enough. Uh, but um, uh, as you'll see in this cheat sheet, right, these are technical uh, tools that people use and they try to understand, is this really a security problem? So understand what have people observed so far, right? Somebody has probably looked at some logs. Somebody has probably looked at the processes running on the system. So find out what did they base their theories on? And what did they see? Were there alerts issued? Was intrusion detection involved? What did it find? I find that in many cases, people forget that uh, certain other teams might have additional visibility into the environment. If you're th going into this problem with a security mindset, right away you're looking at firewall logs, you're looking at network intrusion logs. What about OS level logs? Talk to the sysadmin. Hey, what about application level logs? Talk to whoever manages the web server or logs specific to the application. Talk to the developers. And also consider how much of the data that was gathered so far is actually usable. Because in many cases, um, people who perform this initial survey, they don't necessarily know what to look for. They maybe are new to this environment as well. And so sometimes what they collect isn't all that useful, isn't all that meaningful. Maybe they looked at all the wrong things. You're thinking, how much data can you use already? Because later on, you'll need to examine this again, probably. And you want to know how much work can you save yourself so that you can rely on whatever was collected so far. And also consider what information have we lost? Because every time you touch a system, you run a command on it, you look at a file, you modify the system state. And that's why it's really important to understand what specific tools were used to qualify this issue and to determine that it's a security problem. Because by just performing that initial survey, the administrators may have deleted all the tracks. You want to understand that. And that's why I always ask about the specific tools that were used to understand what maybe has already been lost. And it's not to criticize the administrator, because the reality is to qualify any problem, the administrator needs to look at the affected systems or applications. And by doing that, inevitably, some data is going to be lost. So yeah, so the type of questions that I ask here are, well, what do you do to determine that this is a security problem? What tools did you use? What commands did you run? In many cases, people actually don't remember, I find. They, they will say, well, I don't know. I just opened command shell, and I just maybe their history file exists if they were using Unix. What steps were taken to contain the problem? Because what I find is that whoever performs this initial response, which is usually not a security person, may have decided to act to contain the problem. And I'm not saying they did it incorrectly. Maybe they did it the right way. Maybe they pulled the plug and the system is disconnected from the network. Maybe they terminated that process that they thought is malicious. Maybe they shut down the box. And maybe it was the right thing to do. You just want to understand what did they do to contain the problem. Maybe they did nothing. That's an important finding as well. Did they see anything suspicious in the logs? Did they need suspicious alerts got generated? You want to just, yet again, you're just still absorbing information. And lastly, now is the, is the point where you can actually start making some recommendations. You know who is who. You know what's the nature of the problem. You understand the environment a little bit. You understand what tools were used and what, uh, what information the theories were based on. And now, maybe an hour later, maybe two hours later, or maybe just 10 minutes later, now you can start thinking about, so, so now what do we do? And now is when you can start taking those concrete steps that NIST gives you regarding identifying the problem and containing it and eradicating it and returning back to business. But keep in mind that that process may have been documented, but maybe nobody has looked at those policies and procedures for years. Maybe they were never created. Maybe they were purchased from Amazon and not really adapted to your specific requirements. So don't assume that people know what to do next, even at the technical stage. That's kind of why I've been preparing these cheat sheets and handing them out. So I try to come into an incident, and if the company doesn't have very specific steps for what they need to do and feel comfortable doing that, well, then I try to give them some, some guidance in terms of you know, as little cheat sheets that, like the ones that I've been handing out. Here's another very important question to ask. And I find that this 
is where the reality differs, differs from many um, textbook examples that you might, may, may read about. Uh, because in many cases, when people talk about incident response, they right away assume that it, it's the same thing as forensics. A problem has happened, hold on, before we touch the system, let's clone it, and let's do all of our analysis on the hard drive, let's do pull memory contents, and that's the right way to approach forensic analysis. But don't assume that the company should start performing formal forensic analysis. Maybe that's not the best thing for the business to do. Maybe the, the, the systems that were affected can't afford to be down when you're, while you're cloning the hard drive. Maybe it's better to simply perform some lightweight live analysis of the box. And maybe it doesn't need to be shut down. Maybe it shouldn't. These are not really your calls to make. These are the calls for your legal department to make. These are the calls for the business and data owners to make. That's why it's important to be talking to them. But what I always ask at this point, once I know who the authoritative decision maker is, I always ask, so we've got two paths we can go by now. We can start looking at this live system that's been affected, load up some tools, maybe look at the processes, pull them down, do some memory uh, analysis. We can start looking at logs. It'll probably get us our answers faster. But unfortunately, that means that every time we look at the live box, we'll be tainting the evidence, which means that if we ever need to do formal forensic response, now our data may be a little bit less valid. And so I give that option, and somebody who is the decision maker here, the business decision maker, needs to say, no, no, no. Stop what you're doing. Proceed with formal forensics. More and more, though, I find that companies care less about formal forensics and would much rather perform live, fast analysis so they can quickly understand the nature of the problem and go back to business as soon as possible, and they care less about being able to use that information in court. That's just my own personal perspective on this. I've been seeing more and more companies go that way. But ask the business decision maker. Don't just go one way or the other. Don't assume these things. And as you're planning, about your, next, as you're planning your next steps, consider, well, what tools do you have available in this environment? You may want to look at memory. You may want to look at network. Maybe you want to put a network sniffer in there to observe who's communicating with the systems. Well, maybe none of those tools are available to you. Maybe this is a very locked down environment. I've seen situations where an environment was very locked down, and I even had a hard time getting some tools into it or getting some data out of it because it was really set up as a very contained island. Think about how you're going to get data in and out because you need to get some data out if you're going to be looking at logs. Do you have a network sniffer available that you can put in there, for example? So yeah, so I ask those types of questions. Do we have any specific procedures that we must follow because they were designed beforehand? Does anybody know how to follow them? Has anybody trained in them? Do we want to do live forensics, live analysis of formal forensics? Uh, how do we get files off these systems? And how can we monitor the environment? And also, right away, you're also thinking, well, how are we going to get back into business? And getting back into business will often mean restoring the system to a known trusted state from, from tape. Has anybody ever done a backup on the system? Maybe no. Get that information out there so that you could start thinking, well, what do you do next? How recent is the backup? Do we know if the backup may, be, may have been infected as well? And, yeah, and, and now is when you're really saying, well, who's going to do what next? Which people are going to go on site? Which people are going to do formal forensic analysis or live analysis? Which people are going to communicate? So now is when you're thinking about formal um, incident response that gets more technical, that is pretty well documented and understood. And I'm not really going to get into it. And just kind of to wrap up, I, I, wa I want to, to highlight the point that bad things will happen regardless whether you're prepared for them or not. Right? Incidents happen even to the best of organizations, and incidents happen even to organizations that aren't prepared for them. But I've seen many of the organizations that had a breach weren't quite ready for handling it. But, turn, but they came out OK because they took the time to ask the right questions and, and, and were calm. And so that's why I wanted to talk about questions. And because I feel that it's a very effective way of gaining control over the uh, situation. So I've been on this uh, uh, cheat sheet mania lately. And so what, what I did is the, the questions that I've been asking, I prepared a cheat sheet where uh, you know, I've, I've documented all these questions and the, 
and additional guidelines that I've been discussing. So uh, the major takeaway, really, is yet another cheat sheet that I've got from you. And if I didn't print uh, enough, I'll give you a, you know, you can download it from my website. And you can, um, I have a Word version of this, so you can edit it. And just one last thought before I open this for, for any questions or comments is uh, kind of a, maybe a Zen thought that it's better to know some of the questions than all of the answers. Too many people walk into the situation, start giving orders, start assuming that they know what's going on. And I find that by knowing what questions to ask, you'll do well by yourself and by the organization that you're helping out. So the cheat sheets that I've handed out, you can download them off my website. You can customize them to your heart's delight. But I wanted to ask, what are your thoughts on this? Have you found additional questions that are worth asking? Have you found uh, any, any other tips that recognize situations where companies aren't prepared for dealing with them? What are your thoughts? Any questions, any comments regarding this? Yes? Have you seen dry runs being affected? Or? Have I seen uh, dry runs that were affected? Uh, um, yes. I mean, the more you're prepared, of course, the better you're going to handle the incident. And I'm not saying, you know, you'll never be prepared, so don't try to prepare. I'm saying, yeah, prepare this, whiteboard this, dry run through incidents. The more you're prepared, the better. But my premise is that there are some companies, and no matter how often you tell them, be prepared, dry run, test your procedures, they won't. So, yeah, so uh, as an incident handler, you have some control over yourself and the people you're going to collaborate with. So yeah, walk through this process. Ask them these questions. Make sure they're familiar with it. Uh, just don't assume that the people whom you're going to be helping have done any kind of preparation. If they've done, you know, that's a bonus. Yes? Uh, hypothetically speaking, from a, uh, say a small business point of view, um, say you have a small business that has you know, really talented people and uh, they have an incident and they want to go about doing forensics because mm -hmm. uh, say they, they, they suspect that it was you know, a disgruntled employee or something. How, how, from a legal point of view, how do you go about doing that clone of say you know, a system and then bring it without bringing in a third party mm -hmm. to then go in front of a judge and say, no, no, we, you know, we DD the hard drive. It's the state that it's in right now. It hasn't been touched. This is how it was. Here's our, here's our uh, documented evidence without, say, bringing in SANS or SATNIS yeah. or the FBI. Yeah, so, so you're saying, let's say you've got a small shop, but you've got really talented people who know what they're doing, and they feel comfortable performing some forensic analysis. How do they collect the data so they can use it later on in court? This is yet, yet a, a similar question that I kind of tried to gently deflect because it's more of a legal question, and, and I'm not qualified to answer it. But, but I find that, first of all, recognize that uh, as, as, a, as a commercial entity and a private party, and not law enforcement, your requirements are different, and you tend to have a little bit more slack regarding chain of custody. But if you use tools that uh, are acceptable, like DD, let's say, if you take uh, cryptographic hashes of what you find, if you can uh, confidently say that whatever data you've captured was very unlikely to have been tampered with, then I think you're going along this uh, the right way. But, but for, specific res uh, for specific advice, uh, I'm not a forensic expert, nor am I a legal expert, so that's why that's probably as much as I feel comfortable saying regarding that topic. Yeah. So any, anything else? Uh, well, I'll be around if anybody has any questions or comments. Thank you very much for your attention, folks. Uh, one last thing I ask before you leave, you've got eval sheets on, on your tables. Just mark them up. Uh, it, it'll, it's useful for me to get some feedback and for the conference organizers to see what you've liked. Uh, about this uh, this presentation, but yeah, thank you very much for your attention.